One thing that I'm... Okay, I'm, I'm saying things. Uh, okay. Um... It's... Is the slide go. behind me changing? Oh, very slowly, okay. <laughs> Okay, we're good now? Okay, then let's start this again. Maybe you already see the slide behind me, I don't know how big the delay of this thing is. So, hello and welcome to the first live panel on how to heighten the quality of your streams and videos. So, in this panel we won't necessarily go too deep in what, on what to put in your streams, because there are more panel, panels after this one. We are more talking about the technical aspects of OBS broadcasting in general. But first of all, what it actually qualifies to, to put me here on stage? So, first of all, my name is Simon Koster. I'm from Germany, grew up in the UK. Um, I'm a video engineer, which basically means I need to know everything there is to know about video technology, from the camera all the way to uh, video compression and whatnot. I've been in this industry for around about six years now. And I've worked on projects like Overwatch Contenders, Red Bull Woolaloo 1 and 2, uh, the DreamHack 2020 where I was a camera operator, and also on the Rainbow League 2020 final. So if you've seen some of those streams, you, well, probably have seen my work. Um, so, then here are some studio picks, by the way, I brought for you. Um, Rainbow, uh, Rainbow GSA League was one of the biggest events that I've ever, well, managed. Uh, to say that video wise and I also brought some a little nice video for your gift where I uh, almost fell off the stage in front of 200,000 people on the Dreamhack 2020 which was fun I had a little bit of an anxiety attack after that but anyway it worked out so what specifically are we going to talk about so in general first of all we're talking about audio because the thing is, most people won't have your stream open in a main tab. They will have it open in a separate tab, running on their phone while they're doing the dishes. So they will hear you more likely than they will actually see you. So we, were talking about, so we will be talking about microphones, how to process your audio, just some little tips and tricks uh, I picked up over the years in working in the industry. Then the largest sector, because, well, I work in that sector, is broadcasting, uh, especially stream settings, recording settings, the advanced settings of OBS, like the mysterious advanced settings where people say you can break things. We'll talk about that. And also, I know most of you probably do VR chat, camera work, but I still think it's important to understand how real cameras and real lighting can change your stream setup. And maybe one of you actually uses a camera and light. And I'll just tell you some things that I think is necessary to know to make your stream just a little bit extra so that people start watching you. So then, First of all, audio microphones. So I'm guessing uh, that most of you are using a large diaphragm microphone like the Rode NTA1. Don't be scared by those graphs, by the way. Um, so in general, large diaphragm microphones have a very good noise performance because of their large membrane. They generate more voltage so they can make your voice sound a bit nicer. The problem with these is they have a very short dynamic range. So from you being too quiet to you clipping because you're streaming, uh, screaming to your audience is a very, very, very short range. And that also includes, you also have to be rather close to the microphone because of the large membrane, you need a lot of air force to move it. So in general, those aren't the perfect microphones to use in a stream setup. They are used in studio setups because as you can see, I think it's right here, the frequency pickup of these microphones is flat. So no matter what you do with it, it will perfectly, well, resemble the processing you do afterwards with it. But again, and you need an audio engineer at all times on the microphone to just manage it constantly. But luckily, it has a smaller cousin. I think we can call it cousin, which is the small membrane microphone or small diaphragm microphone. You probably have seen these in streams from Jacksepticeye, Markiplier, PewDiePie, which is the Shure SM7B. It's not strictly a small diaphragm microphone, it's a hybrid in between, but for the sake of simplicity, it's a small diaphragm microphone. Um, so specifically, it's a small diaphragm microphone for voices, because there are some for guitars, drums, whatever. The cool, cool thing about small diaphragm microphones is they are way more frequency accurate, which means you can actually put them outside of your camera field of view and have a hidden microphone while you still have a nice voice pickup. 
The thing is, also, it can pick up way more frequencies than a large diaphragm microphone can. The, the normal uh, small um, large diaphragm microphone ends at 15,000 hertz, while many uh, small diaphragm microphones go up all the way to 20,000 hertz. So, and also, as you can see right here on this nice graph below me, you can see that dotted line, and that dotted line resembles the frequency response of this microphone, which is way more human-like than the large diaphragm microphones. You maybe notice that if you do frequency sweep with your headsets, that, it's, that 50 hertz sounds way more quiet than 1,000 hertz. This is due because human voices generally generate between 1,000 and 10,000 hertz, so we're more sensitive to those frequencies. And so to resemble a human voice, the frequency pickup of this microphone is way more human-like. And also, generally, small diaphragm microphones are a lot cheaper than large membrane microphones. But I don't expect, to you, I don't, I don't expect of you to glue this microphone to your VR headset, headset and walk with it and probably drag it across the ground. And that is why I want to introduce you to the microphones that we use where I work, and that is a caster headset, specifically this thing. Um, that is a bit more of the expensive sites. There are cheaper alternatives. The prices range from 20 bucks all the way to 1,000 bucks. But this is a so-called caster headset. As you can see, it's a microphone and headset in one. And the difference between a normal headset and a caster headset is a caster headset generally puts more effort into designing a good microphone. Cool thing is, you only have one cable to worry about. It won't move away from your mouth. It doesn't cover your face too much. And it's relatively cheap when you look at it as a headset and microphone combination. So for all of the VR streamers out there, definitely take a look at that little guy. But one big issue both of these microphones have, except the large diaphragm ones, is noise. Because they're rather small, they pick up smaller vibrations quite easily, so noise is a huge issue with these. But, obviously, there's a cure for that in processing. So the first thing I want to introduce you to is the gate. This is the gate of the Yamaha QL1. It's a very large mixer. You don't need to worry about that. But this is in general what a gate looks like. It helps in general with unwanted noise. It opens when the audio file gets over a specific threshold and it closes when it is under it. So let's just say you're an audio file and you want to get in that cool nightclub. There's a gatekeeper in front of that and you're at negative 30 decibels. He will not let you in because his threshold is set at negative 26 decibels. But then somebody suddenly talks into the microphone. So you jump up to negative 20 decibels, so the gatekeeper allows you in. So you're now in the nightclub dancing your way around, and suddenly you fall back to negative 30 decibels. But don't worry, because of the hold time, the gatekeeper won't shut the gate instantly. It will actually keep you in there for 200 milliseconds more, so that you have some time to maybe catch up to negative 20 decibels. Now let's just say you stay over that 200 milliseconds, so the gatekeeper wants you out again because you're too quiet. He doesn't shut the gate instantly because that would just sound wrong. He actually has a release time, so that means he closes the gates slowly so that you fade down. In general, this is the thing that I basically let run over everything that is human voices in-game and music and what. We don't let this run because it's a bit unnecessary, but this is just good for unwanted noise, even like keyboard clicking. If it's quieter than your threshold, it will not get through. Obviously, when you start to speak and still click away, it will get through. So we covered the low end. Let's cover the high end, because, well, I'm guessing that you don't normally just stay quiet all the time. I'm guessing you scream to your audience when something crazy happens. And clipping audio is one of the audio engineer's worst nightmares. And a compressor can help you with that. So in general, a compressor compresses audio. Yeah. How it works is actually a lot simpler than it looks. So you have a threshold, which means at that point, the compressor starts to act. And then you have a ratio. And that ratio just tells you how much to lower the input decibels level to another degree. So let's just say you're streaming, so you're at zero decibels, you're clipping. Because of the compressor, it will Let's just say we put it to a ratio of 2.5 to 1, it will lower it down to around about negative 1.5 decibels. This isn't like a magic thing that automatically gets rid all of, of all of your clipping audio, because generally nothing can do that, but it's just a good heads room. And to be honest, I put it on everything. Music, in-game, voices, especially Discord. Even on our master out, we have a very slight compressor on it. 
because it just helps so much more with not blowing the eardrums away of your audience. So we covered the low end, the high end, but what is in between? So here's a little sauce that I'm giving you, how to make your stream stand out in front of every other stream out there, which is the, the equalizer. In, in general, the equalizer makes your voice sound beautiful. You probably know you're in the cinema, you want to watch a film, and suddenly a commercial comes up. And you hear that voice, that smoothly silk voice that's still extremely clear to understand. That is done with the equalizer. In general, what they do is they cut everything below 50 hertz, because nobody can talk that deep. And everything that comes in under 50 hertz is just noise, so we cut that out. The next thing that we do is we boost the lows, that's between 50 and 500 hertz, because that just makes your voice so much smoother. Doesn't matter if you have a high-pitched or low-pitched voice, this is the way to go if you want to have a smooth voice. What we then do is we lower the mids, that's between 500 and 3000 hertz. We lower these because letters like are generally in that area, and we don't want your audience to just die from those letters, so we lower those a bit. The next thing that we do, we boost the mid highs quite a bit. That's between 3000 and 10,000 hertz, depending on the person who's talking. This is where the clarity of your voice comes through. Somebody who has like this very clear voice that's understandable across the room, he probably has a very large number of his vocal cords hidden in those frequencies. The cool thing is, if somebody is clicking through Twitch or YouTube and suddenly stumbles across your stream, well, they will be stuck with your voice because it pierces through everything. Even if you're on a Discord call, your voice, your voice will pierce through all the other voices if you have this enabled. With the highs, to be honest, you can do whatever you like with them. It depends. Like, ask 10 different audio engineers, they will give you 12 different answers. So just do whatever you like with the highs, whatever feels correct to you. Because the cool thing with the equalizer is, as long as you have a line that looks similar to this one, you are not doing anything wrong. You can twiddle around as much as you want. On so many broadcasts, our audio engineers just turned the equalizer off and then back on again while we were live just to see what happened and nobody noticed. But those are these tiny little tweaks that will make your stream stand out quite a bit more. To be honest, the OBS equalizer and gate and whatnot is just terrible. So what we sometimes use is a plugin, a, VS2, a VST2 plugin, from Reaper. It's completely free to use. You download it, you install it in OBS, and then you have so much better gates and compressors and whatnot at your hand and your disposal that you can use to make your stream just sound that much better. But now, that was a bit much information, probably, I know. Um, I'll talk with the hosts of this convention to see if I can get you the link to this Google Sheet so you can read up of some of the information if you like to. Let's go with the biggest section now, which is broadcasting. So in general, we first of all have to talk about both encoders that OBS offers you, which is X264 and NVENC. So first of all, let's start with X264, X264 bloody hell. So first of all, the cons of it. It only uses the CPU. If you enable this encoder, only the CPU is used. And it is very, very, very heavy on your CPU, because let's just say you're playing VR chat and your CPU is at 100%, it cannot fit an extra stream in there. Even if you have the best Threadripper and whatnot, it will probably just look bad, because even if you have enough resources, X264 is prone to tear and to block. Tearing is, you probably know this when you're gaming, like when the top half of your screen is in front of the bottom half, so you have like this big split in between, and blocking is... So the extreme scenario of this is when you have like pink blocks everywhere, and you can't see the image, that is in general blocking. So in general, I don't recommend X264. It was, to be honest, it also wasn't invented for this purpose. It was invented for video rendering, not real-time rendering, but our computers just have gotten that good over the years that we started using it as a live encoder. But here's the thing, every program has its pros. So what are the pros on X264? Yeah, so... In my time, I didn't find any. Like, the only thing that we had is problems. The only good thing is, it is compatible with every machine that you have, as long as it has a dual-core CPU. It doesn't mean that it will run smooth, but it, at least it will start up. So let's look at the other side, NVENC. 
So NVENC is invented by NVIDIA. It is actually rather new. It has been around for quite a while, but it just recently has really, really spiked up in popularity with the broadcast world. First of all, let's start with the cons again. So first of all, you need an NVIDIA GPU. Like, that's sadly necessary. To be honest, you even need an uh, NVIDIA GPU that is the GTX 1060 or better. You can still use like 960s, 950s, whatever, but they won't have the benefits of the new NVEC architecture. So in general, I just recommend getting a 1060 for like 100 bucks on Craigslist or eBay or whatnot and using that for your encoding. Because I'll show you an example why NVEC is so much better in the next slide. But first of all, let's talk about the pros. The first pro is it uses the GPU's encoding cores. And if you gamed at some point and open Task Manager, you will realize that the encoding and decoding cores of the GPUs are not used at all. Sometimes they're 10 or 20%, but that is very rare. So they use those cores that aren't actually being used while you game. So the other thing is it was invented by NVIDIA for internet streaming. Like it isn't invented for broadcasting or teleproductions or something like that. It is made for internet streaming, specifically for low-budget streamers or streamers that don't have a million dollars on their hand. And even the million ones use NVEC. Well, just a little secret between us. And also, GPUs were made for this. Like, the entire existence of a GPU is to encode and decode video data. So it doesn't make any sense to put that load onto the CPU, who is actually only there to crunch numbers and basically nothing else. This also presents the good side that we have less that we are less likely to drop frames. We are way more color accurate. We have way better performances in any machine, and we have no blocking or tearing to seek up, because well, GPUs can spit out full frames at every interval because that is what they do all the time. I actually brought a little picture uh, for you right here. Um, you. You can see on the left side the NVENC at 6 megabits and on the right side X264 at 6, uh, 6 megabits again. While we can't clearly make out the bottom side of the car or the, to or the ball looks very blurry or even like the lines, like on the top of the screen the blue lines are barely make, uh, make you can barely make them out in X6, X264. On NVENC, you can clearly see the underside of the car, the ball is way sharper and crisper and you can clearly see the lines on the top of the screen. I hope this gets through, by the way, to you, because double encoding and stuff like that. So that is why I highly recommend using NVENC instead of X264. Okay, we covered that now. Let's dive into the OBS broadcasting settings, or the stream settings. First things first, we're gonna put the output mode to advanced, because we can do way more funny stuff in there. So first things first, the encoder. Always use NVENC. We just talked about this. X264 is just not as good as NVENC. So then rescale output. What is rescale output? So let's just say you always produced in full HD, 1080p. But then you want to start to stream to Facebook, and Facebook only supports 720p. So instead of rearranging your entire canvases and whatnot, you just click that little button, set it to 1280 by 720p, and your image will be a lot sharper because noise isn't that much of a problem. With downscaling, when you go from Full HD to HD, four pixels are averaged down to one, which means you will have way less noise and whatnot, and your image just looks that much sharper. I still recommend in streaming in 1080p, 60fps, because that's just so much better, and Twitch chat loves 1080p, 60fps. Okay, then if we move further along, we will find rate control and bitrate. So both of these things are interlinked because the bitrate and the rate control, well, I'll just start talking about it. First of all, we are going to talk about CBR, which stands for constant bitrate. This just means that OBS is trying to be around the bitrate you chose as closely as it can. So if I put 6,500 kilobits, it will sometimes drop to 6,300, sometimes peak up to 6,700. In general, it will keep around that area. If you're streaming a 1080p 60fps signal, Twitch recommends 6,000 kilobits for non-partners. You can still get away with 6,500, we found out. Twitch just doesn't care. And partners can get away with 8,000. On YouTube, that's a bit of a special case. They allow you 9,000 kilobits, but the, least people, the less people are watching your YouTube stream, the lower your quality will be, 
I think 3,500 is like their lowest limit. I think when you have around 1,000 viewers, they will give you 9,000, but if you're lower than 1,000, they will only give you, I think, between 3,500 and 6,000 kilobits. Also determines from your subscription count, whatnot, it's an entire nightmare. Then, next up, we have VBR, variable bitrate. <laughs> Again, variable bitrate came after CBR, but I don't see the usage nowadays for it. Back in the day, it had its usage, but now it's just, it just clogs up your CPU. It is, the quality is way less than in CBR because you are determining by computer, you can pick from 3,000 kilobits to 6,000 kilobits, anything in between. And it can happen that the system chooses 3,000 when you actually need 6,000 kilobits. In general, it was made to scale down video sizes so that you have more space, but in the age of SSDs and huge terabytes of HDDs, I think it's just an outdated form of recording and compressing video. Then we have <clears throat> my most fun part to trigger. Come on now. There we are. CQP, which stands for Constant Quantization Parameter. Y you don't have to worry about that. It's, it's made for nerds, like myself. It is only used for testing and gathering data. You can change quite a bit on this. It is used to change the density and size of each individual macro block and the compression of those, but it is only used to test out a codec. So you don't have to worry about that anything because it doesn't make sense to use it. I think Twitch and YouTube will just block your signal if you try to send in CQP anyway, so... And then we have the last one, which is lossless, which just means you have no compression whatsoever. In general, if you don't have like the ballsiest internet ever with like 100 megabits upstream, you won't be able to push this to YouTube. We did once at like 50,000 kilobits for testing, which didn't work out at all because we got an email from YouTube telling us, hey guys, please stop this. So I, I don't recommend actually doing this except when you want a funny email from YouTube. So then, if we go a bit further down, we will drop into keyframing presets and profile. So, key fr so let's start with the keyframe or keyframe intervals. The keyframe intervals is just the metadata of your signal. So that includes resolution, format, profile, color space, etc. So that basically people can choose 1080p 60fps. YouTube and Twitch need that keyframe. Uh, sending Twitch and YouTube both want one every two seconds. You can set it to zero, which just means OBS will determine it automatically, but I learned in our industry we don't like automation for some reason, so we just put it to two. The next thing is preset. So preset determines the load on your CPU. General max quality just means you will have a better picture quality, and max performance you will have better performance. If you have performance issues while OBS is running, I would recommend changing some of these settings to see what it does. Just keep in mind, preset and profile are both linked. Profile means it's the handling of the compression. High means you have a better moving image because the compression gets a lot of CPU power. And baseline means you have better performance but a worse image. In general, you can remember, if you're using max quality and baseline profile, you will have a better image. But if you're using max pro performance and a high profile, you will have a worse image because you choose quality. Okay, a bit much to be honest, but let's continue. We'll power through this together. So then. Look ahead. What is look ahead? Well, look ahead is the automatic B frame manager. When it's on, it just means that you have a better moving image. If it's off, it's better performance. I'll generally recommend turning this off because YouTube will force their B frames onto you anyway. So it doesn't matter if you turn this on or off. Turn it off, it, you will have way more performance on your hands when it's off than it on. Then, psycho visual tuning. So, gotta pause here for a minute and put a flag down. This thing is the magic of NVENC. If you're using NVENC, it doesn't make sense at all to turn this off. Always leave it on if you can, because it's just the magic how NVENC gives you a, such a better image than X264 can with the same bitrate. So how does this PVT actually work? So PVT can shift the place and density of macro blocks. So what does that mean realistically? So let's just say, you're playing a nice game of League of Legends, and you have a bunch of trees around you that are not moving at all. So NVENC will realize that and give those trees less data. 
movement, we have less data, quality will be the same because of no movement. But in the middle of your screen, you have this epic intense fight going on with lights and whatnot ever. Well, NVEC has those extra bits, so it will just focus those bits into the fight, where there's a lot of movement. And this is what makes NVEC so special, and that, it, that is why it uses artificial intelligence and, and RTX cores to determine what parts actually need those extra bits and what do not. In general, never turn this off. If, you're using, if you can use NVENC because you have an RTX card, GTX 1060 includes to that because it has something to do with the architecture, not RTX cores, don't turn this off. It's just, it's just as again, magic. Okay then, next thing, GPU. What the hell is that? GPU, okay. Here in OBS, you can actually change what GPU is used for encoding. So let's just say you have a 2070 and you experience some lagging issues when you're playing VR chat and streaming at the same time. So instead of buying a 3090 for one and a half thousand dollars, you can just go to eBay or Craigslist, buy a 2060, relatively cheap, put it into your second S uh, SLI slot, power to it, and you can just tell OBS only use the 1060 as the main encoder. So the first GPU will only game for you, and the second one, will actually do the encoding for you. This will give you a much higher performance boost than a 3090 could, because the cool thing is, these things don't change all too much. Like 10 to 15 years it takes the industry to actually adapt, like NVENC or stuff like that. So if you buy a 2016 now, you can still use it in 10 years while you game on your 3090 and uh, games are like in 8K at VR or whatnot. So if you have some money to spare, I definitely recommend this alternative if you want more performance. Okay then, max B frames. So I've talked about B frames quite a bit, but what the hell are they actually? So, X, uh, so maybe you heard of the term H.264. H.264 is the compression the world is running at. No matter what you're seeing, if you're watching something on the telly, recording something with your phone, no matter what it is, the later video file will be compressed in H.264 or its brother H.265. But H.265 isn't that adapted, so we just ignore that. So the B frames are the main driver of this H.264 codec. By the way, codec stands for coder and decoder. Both ways, like YouTube has the decoder of H.264 and OBS has the coder of H.264. Twitch and YouTube both require a B frame every two frames. Look ahead can change this to zero, but yet again, I wouldn't recommend turning look ahead on because YouTube will force two B frames on you anyway. So how do B work and why are they the main drive of H.264? Well, let's just say you have a video and this is an iframe. An iframe has all of the information that an image can. So you go outside, you take a picture with the camera, that's an iframe. It's perfect image, no compression whatsoever. Here's the thing, to save like at 60 FPS, every frame to be an iframe that is a rather wasteful bandwidth. So what some godforsaken engineers did is they develop B frames. So what they do is they split this frame into a grid layout. These little blocks are called macro blocks and the size and density of them is determined by the bitrate. The higher the bitrate, the more macro blocks can fit into it. The lower the bitrate, well, the, least, the less macro blocks can fit then happens is instead of saving a second iframe on the second frame, the B frame interprets how to move the macro blocks to the second position to give you the second image. Our human eyes doesn't realize this because, well, nowadays it's just that good. This can cut file sizes down to half. So instead of needing to stream at HD to not completely overwhelm your internet provider, you can stream at full HD with the same bitrate as you would have in HD when you would have been using complete iframes. To make this a bit more simple, and to put this in the word of Captain Disillusion, pub B frames puppeteer iframes around. To be honest, he said P frames puppeteer iframes around, but P and B, basically, they're, they're the same. Let's just say that for now. I hope this wasn't going too fast. It's a ton of information we have to cover. People study this for five, six years and still don't know what's up, so there's that. Compared to that to 50 minutes. So then, let's get to recording settings. Stream and recording settings are generally similar, but there are some hidden features in OBS that I 
do recommend if you only record in OBS. So by the way, if you're only recording and not streaming, definitely set the recording bitrate to 12,500, because that's the bitrate YouTube recommends for their videos. But if you're streaming and recording, I definitely recommend only to use the streaming bitrate, because to be honest, not a lot of people will actually notice. So then, if we go into the recording settings in OBS, we will find the recording format and this audio track. So most of you probably record in MP4. The problem with MP4 is it must be closed before it can be used. This means if OBS crashes or your recording is just bad, you will lose all of your data. You cannot recover them because MP4 wasn't closed. But luckily, some very, very intelligent people invented MKV, or the Matryoshka Multimedia Container. In case of a crash, you will not have any data loss, because MKV doesn't have to be closed. So you can just suddenly stop the recording, and you will still have all of your data. Even if your computer completely blacks out, you will still have the data, nothing to worry about. The only problem is, editing software cannot read this. You have to remux the file. You can just do that under File, Remux File, and ta-da, you have an MP4 file. But one thing that is so special about MKV, why it gets its name Matryoshka, these little Russian dolls, is it can hold an infinite number of layers. Infinite number of video layers, subtitle layers, even audio layers. And here it gets very interesting for us. Because we can, let's just this your voice. The second track is Discord, and the third is the in-game. If you just record it with MPV or uh, fly or whatever, it's all compressed down into one audio track. So if you want to cut out Discord and only keep your voice in in-game, you can't do that. But with MKV, you can go into the advanced audio settings you see right there, probably, and you can choose to record in-game to track 3, Discord to track 2, and your voice to track 1. Then you only need to enable those tracks under the recording format, and when you remux the file and drag it into your editing software, well, congratulations, you now have three different audio layers that you can cut off and take Discord out, only leave your voice in in-game, no matter what. It's just so much easier to level audio in that way. General, I just recommend starting to do that practice because that will increase your video quality by quite a bit. So, we covered the basic settings. Let's turn to the settings where a lot of people online said that you can break things. And just for the record, I have broken more things with the general settings in OBS than with the advanced settings. No kidding, we had a private, well, YouTube server on our hand one time, and I managed to crash that thing. So, that, 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 is a, that, that was fun. Anyway, <laughs> let's start with the advanced settings. So, the first thing that will smile on your face is the color format. So, the color format, in generally just just means how color is being processed. You can see right here, I hope that they're actually seeing this in 709, right here we have RGB, CMYK, and Pantone. All of these green tones are exactly the same if you look at the hex code. But because they're processed differently, they actually look different on your screen. So what color formats does OBS support? So the first thing is NV12. This is optimized for streaming. This is the stuff that YouTube wants, Twitch wants. Whenever you stream, you should use NV12 because that is what the standard is online nowadays. Then we also have i420, which is basically the standard for video displays, recordings, whatnot. If you're recording something with your phone, it is recorded in i420. If you're recording something with your fancy DSLR camera, it is probably recorded in i420. So this is the... Basically, the, if you are only recording in OBS, I recommend using i420 because YouTube will also, rec uh, will also accept it in i420 and only push it in i420. And NV12, if you're streaming, you also have the option, option to choose from i44, i444, and RGB, which are both lossless recording methods. There are some differences between the two, but in general, they don't actually matter that much. RGB is just used for computer recordings and I444 for camera recording. So then, what about color space and color range? So first of all, color range, just keep that at full. You can change between full and partial. I just recommend full because you want full color to be displayed and not partial color. So color space in general, what is that? So color space is what colors can actually 
be shown. The have here on the world is 709. No matter display, your VR headset, your display you're watching right now, your phone, no matter what, if it's not an HDR display, it is calibrated in the 709 ratio. As you can see, it, look, it looks something like this. I have to think mirroredly. <laughs> no matter what it is, it is 709. Then we also have 609, which, is, which was the standard back in the day of CRTVs. They do look quite similar. There are some differences. But in general, 709 is way more supported than 601 nowadays, so I definitely recommend 701, 709 instead of 601. So, so, so many numbers to remember. And then what we also have is sRGB. I'll tell you this. sRGB is just 709. So for some reason, the OBS developers split this into 709 and sRGB, but as far as I know, they're exactly the same, because sRGB stands for standard RGB, or standard red, green, and blue. And the standard red, green, and blue spectrum gets its values from the 709 standard. So you've probably seen when you bought a monitor that it covers 99.8% of the sRGB spectrum, but well, that means that it covers 99.8% of what a normal display should cover. So in general, if you have one that covers 120%, you actually can see more colors, but the issue is because nobody is producing that extra color, it's actually a bit useless, except when you actually develop graphics that, are, that need that extra color space. So uh, the, the one thing, by the way, one, one, there's one difference between sRGB and 709 is that the gamma is a tiny bit different. I think the knee on the top of the gamma curve is just slightly more rounded, but no, nobody will notice that. Seriously, no, nobody will actually notice that. We produced an sRGB on 709 and nobody, nobody saw the difference. By the way, while we are here, there's this cool little button called Automatically Remux to MP4. So if you're recording an MKV, you don't have to go to File, Remux File and stuff like that. You can just click that little button and it will automatically well, convert MP4 to MKV for you. So you don't have to worry about that. By the way, if OBS crashes, it doesn't do that, but your file still get, doesn't get corrupted. So then, let's the real world <laughs> videography. So I know a lot of you probably use the cameras in VRChat, but I think it's important to understand how real cameras and stuff like that can work so that you can pull out so much more out of the virtual cameras you have here in VRChat. Because the cool thing is, VRChat it doesn't abide by the laws of physics, so I have seen actual lenses here in some mods that add light to a scene, so they basically have a negative aperture which is physically impossible, but hey, virtual reality doesn't make it possible. So then, I really wanted to tell you what camera to choose, like for your stream setup, but the thing is, there are so many cameras nowadays that I just simply can't. There's so many factors that depend on this. But in general, if you want to use them for streaming, I recommend a camera that has full HD, so that's 1920 by 1080 p Keep a look out for those numbers because some manufacturers are just not very nice and say it's full HD when in fact it's HD, because full HD isn't actually a term used in broadcasting, it's just a term that has developed itself over the years. Then we have obviously 60 FPS because you want that buttery smooth 60 FPS. An HDMI output, it doesn't have to be a full one, it can be a mini one because you somehow need to capture the camera output. And also it should be made for constant recording and this is something you should be looking out for, they won't tell you that. A lot of DSLRs for example will shut down after about 10 to 15 minutes. So definitely look out that your camera supports constant recording over a power line and not over the battery, because otherwise you will run into issues that every 15 minutes your camera just goes black. And one thing that is very important, autofocus. Not all cameras have autofocus. Keep an eye on that one. A good example of the camera that I would recommend is the Sony Alpha 7S or 7S2. It's a general all-rounder. If you're looking for a photo camera and a recording camera and a streaming camera, this is the perfect all-rounder for it. Um, I don't actually know the price, to be honest. Most of the time equipment just gets handed to me and I have to use it, so I just completely lost how much that thing costs. But I don't think the 7S, like not the Mark II, like the normal 7S, isn't too expensive nowadays, especially when you buy it used. But here's the thing, a camera without a lens, well, won't look as great. So what lens to choose? Well, this again 
there are so many lens manufacturers from Canon to Zeiss to Leica to Sigma to... Uh, the list could go on and on and on. It basically depends on what you like. But in general, I would look for a lens that has between 15 to 30 millimeters of um, fo um, not focal distance. Distance, you can... Because the camera will probably be rather close to you, so you need a wide depth of field. Here's the thing. Watch out that it doesn't say fisheye, because fisheye will distort your look, and you don't want that. It just looks, well, like through a fisheye. The other thing it should support is a minimum f-sub of 2. I think minimum of 2... The price point is rather okay with like two, and there are a lot of fancy lenses that you can get with an f sub of two. It will give you enough light for the camera to process it, so generally keep around that number. It doesn't have to be precise, just roundabout. Another thing, very important, it should support autofocus. So often, friends of mine bought a lens that doesn't support autofocus and were annoyed that it doesn't support autofocus, even though it told them on the box. So look out for that, because some lenses don't support the autofocus from Sony, some others don't support it from Canon. Just make sure it's cross-compatible. Just because the mount fits doesn't mean that it actually works. Okay then, next thing. You could have the best camera in the world, but if your shot composition is just bad, nobody will want to watch it. So, shot composition, what to do? Very simple. If you have a tripod, you want your camera to be 90 degrees to the tripod, and the lens middle should be on eye level. This will give you a nice clean shot like we see down here. The next thing you want to look out for is medium framing. So that's basically, it just means that you want everything from to be torso and upwards. Because that is where generally all of the talking happens and all of the movements while you're streaming and sitting. So that is just the general perfect angle to be at. Other thing you should be looking out for is the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds just means that when you are looking to the left, you leave space on the left. Like, to be honest, our lovely guy on the left right here looks to the right, so we leave space on the right. The girl up here watches, looks to the left, so we leave space left. You could actually turn this rule of thirds or grid layout on in your camera. Basically, every camera that I ever held has that feature. And you can then line this up. By the way, little tip, these crosses are generally... They, they generally pull the focus of the audience. So if you want the focus to be on your eye or something like that, try to line up that little cross with your eye. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just in general. This will focus the audience towards your eye because we humans like symmetry so much. But here's the thing. You can have the most fanciest camera in the world, the most fanciest shot composition. If it's dark, you won't see anything. So you need lights, obviously. So... I don't recommend just putting up one light and saying, OK, I'm done, because that will just look bad. This is a layout that I recommend. It looks a bit crazy, but it's not that crazy when you actually build it up. So you're in the middle, the little circle, and the camera's on the bottom here. The first light that you set up is the main light. This can be a softbox, an LED panel, whatever you have, even a window. It's just the main source of light that lights up your entire face. What you then add to, well, get rid of all of the shadows the main light just created, you add in a fill. This is just there to reduce shadows. The fill doesn't have to be a light. It can be a white piece of cloth or a wall or like something white that reflects light. You can choose an LED panel or softbox. In general, you just you don't want to get rid of the shadows. You want to reduce the harshness of this of them that the main light is creating. Generally, put the fill 90 degrees from the main view out. So just like that. And the next light, which, to be honest, is the light that I think you should definitely set up, is the key light. So the key light is rather high up, very high up, because it only lights up the outside of yourself. So it accents the model and separates it from the background. And the cool thing is, it can be colored. So if your color space is, for example, orange on your entire streams, just make that key light orange, or green, or blue, or black. Wait, there's no back black light. Anyway, um, in general, just you can change the color of the key light to make your stream look out that tiny bit more. I actually have an example right here where we worked on a Red Bull Faster. You can see right here we have the main light. We wanted a bit of a noir style look to it, so we had a very harsh main light and even a very harsh fill light. Then we have the key light up high in red because, well, Red Bull. And then another light on the bottom here, which is the backlight. 
So the backlight is just a light that illuminates the back, and it can be anything. For example, you know Fluke's setup on the background, you have like this cool light assembly. Well, that is the backlight of his scene. You can just add that and make it look a tiny bit more pretty. One tip, on the back line of your shelf, when you have a shelf in your background, just glue down cheap LED strips and power them. This will make your entire scene just look so much more awesome because light is just awesome. <laughs> uh, this is, by the way, what the, lo what the shot looked like. As you can see, we have a nice... We, have, we still have some shadows, but they're not too harsh or anything. We have a... I'm still... Oh, no, I'm pointing to the right side. Um, we still have some red edges on one of the main characters, and we have the blue light to illuminate the blue fridge. By the way, this isn't set up in the two, uh, in the two thirds rule because um, framing three subjects is very hard. Look at the Big Lebowski. They did it perfectly in the bar scene, but this is in general how you want your light to look like. Just fiddle around with it. The cool thing with lighting is, again, the same with audio, you can't really screw things up. As long as it looks good, it's good. Nobody will judge you because you used LED bulbs or something like that. If you like the style of LED bulbs, use them. Nobody will care. The only thing that I still have for you is your fill light and your main light should use the same light bulb. This is just due to... Um, the Kelvin, so that uh, to the Kelvin um, value that determines the white balance of your camera, it's just easier for your camera to pull white balance. Okay, quite a bit of information, and I probably talked rather, rather quickly, but still, thank you so much for watching. I hope you still have an awesome Freda 2000. I'm very happy that I was the first panel. The hosts here did an amazing job of hosting this. I know there was a bit of a delay, but they managed it perfectly because of the entire issues they had, so props up for them. I hope you still have an awesome three days here, and I hope that next time you open OPS, you just remember me, maybe, hopefully, maybe you don't want to, that's up to you, but maybe you just go into the advanced settings, fiddle around with them, and just try some things out. And yeah, I hope you picked up some things. See you soon.